What do you do when it's your time to mourn, to cry, to grieve? Grief can be a lonely road. What does it start and where does it end? Join us on this intimate journey of discovery, healing, and transformation. This documentary will explore the many facets of grief. My mother died on Father's Day, June 18, 2017. On that day, my life changed. It was like I was stuck. And I knew that I needed to move forward. And I didn't know how. I needed to prepare for a journey that would empower me to face grief, a grief journey. I knew my story, but was my story different than others? So I decided to go on an excursion to ask others about their grief journey. When I think about um, the journey of grief, it's a lonely place. Um, And I'm only speaking from personal experience um, in the passing of people who've been very dear to me, that it's it's a journey that for me personally, um, I usually take a loan. Um, it's very lonely. It's very isolating. And that can be a good thing in certain phases of grief. But in other phases, it could be um, maybe sometimes not so good to feel alone, alone and isolated. So I think, you know, it just depends on what stage you're in. Uh, at any given moment, but um, grief is definitely a journey that's individual to each individualized person. Thank you. And when you think about grief uh, and how you've had to experience that, and you know, we're talking about having grief journeys, mm-hmm. uh, can you tell us about one of your? Uh, most vivid, most transformative, uh, and uh, most powerful grief journeys that you've had to experience? Um, Well, as I've had, you know, I'm I'm only 47 years old, but um, I've had a lot of important and pivotal um, game changers in my life who uh, have passed, people uh, in my family, as well as um, members of my home church who were very instrumental in me being the person that I am today. And so uh, I've experienced um, grief or the loss of an individual, but my one of my most difficult um journeys of grief was in the passing of my um, cousin, my first cousin, Sandra Faye Clark. Um, That's a loss that really brought my faith in God into question in a very, very um, difficult way. Um, and it's a grief that I dealt with for many, 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 many years. And I had a deep seated unforgiveness, um, towards God d- with the passing of faith. I, I know that a lot of times, uh, you know, with the five stages of grief and anger, 
um, like I said, being one of those. Uh, and I think that you're not alone. A lot of times people are just not angry with themselves, but uh, they also are angry with God. Uh, and some people are in that state or in that uh, phase or in that particular uh, pathway currently on their grief journey. What did you do to maneuver through that and to uh, continue on to a place of healing? Um, it took many years. Um, it wasn't, uh, um, it wasn't an April or a December that could come and go where I wasn't affected, um, with the passing of Faye. Um, it really goes back. It's a journey because just like I say that there was a, there is a grief journey. There was also a journey back to my faith in God uh, after her passing and after my unforgiveness of God um, and how her passing um, happened, my part in it, my um, the part I didn't get to play um, because I had given my word to her. Uh, and I felt that God had cheated me. Um, from being there beside someone that I had walked this journey with during the whole process of her being sick uh, with bone cancer. And so we bonded even the more. And uh, on that particular day, because um, she was so afraid, so afraid, and I had held her and I had... Um, talked to her in her ear and I promised her that I would be back because she never did want to go to sleep and be by herself. And I promised her I would be back if I could just run and pick up my kids and take them to my mom. I would turn around and come right back and for her to hold on. And um, I would not leave her there that night by herself. And by the time I got home and got the children settled, and I had been so tired because I worked, I went straight to the hospital. I would go to the hospital on my lunch hour because she never wanted to be alone. Um, and I just laid down for a moment, in my opinion, just to kind of breathe and regroup. And I dozed off. And the telephone rang, and it was my mother telling me that Faye had passed. And in that moment, something shifted in me. I was angry with myself that I didn't go back immediately. And then I was angry with God because for two reasons primarily. That I gave my word and I was supposed to be there with her when she passed and that he did not heal her. He was supposed to and he did not. Um, and I think a lot of people, they've been there, um, reminded of in the scripture where Mary and Martha told Jesus, had you been here, he never would have died. And so a lot of times we sometimes question the sovereignty of God, um, and that sounds like something that you have had to, that you experienced in that particular situation. Uh, and I want to ask, because you said that it was a journey and that it took years for you to get to a point of, of peace, uh, if that's a good word to use. Um, but what were some of your grief practices that brought you to a point of reconciling uh, your grief and your pain with understanding that um, 
God is still sovereign and God is still good. But for years, I couldn't talk about um, Faye. I couldn't talk about her passing. Uh, when people, and sometimes on when people are dealing with grief, they some people go through it liking to talk about the person. Uh, and so, coming from a big family, people would always be talking about Faye, remembering Faye. And during those times of my unforgiveness and anger, I didn't want to talk about Faye. Um, I just needed to hold on. It was like I was storing up anger. I was storing up grief. I was storing up so much hurt. And it was mine. It was mine. So uh, I didn't want to be in a space where you're laughing and talking and, and, and joyful. I didn't feel like there was anything to be joyful about. I was still in so much pain um, with her, her passing. And so I would isolate myself. I would pull away um, from family members or gatherings. But so I wouldn't talk about her. But my mother would always tell me. And I think on some, because I remember when she called me, I kept saying I was supposed to be there. I told her I was supposed to be there. And she said, and I'm, I didn't want to hear it, or I don't think I really heard it when she said it to me over the phone. She said, God didn't intend for you to be there. Just as soft and as calm. And as weeks went on, and after her funeral and everything, during me being so hurt and angry, um, just out of the clear blue sky, when I would be over my mom's, I don't know if she would see just how angry I was or how unforgiving I was towards myself or towards God. And she would just say at the clear blue sky, we could be in the kitchen or whatever. She just would say, God didn't intend for you to be there. And so one of the things that began to lead me back, because after that, uh, when I did take hold of her question, I had the question of why. You know, why didn't he intend for me to be there? I couldn't understand how being there to take care of her physically like that and being there to drive her to all of these healing services, you know, and, and get her dressed and carry her. And, and um, I mean, some of them we would go to and the minister didn't even show up. So after being there for someone through so many months, uh, I, I, my question was, why? All I said was, I'm going to come back. And why wouldn't God intend for me to be true to my word and for me to be there with her as I had been before? when she took her last breath. And so that also then began my journey of why were other people allowed that to me hadn't been there as much, but they got to bear witness to her testimony because she gave a powerful testimony of her journey of passing, but yet I wasn't allowed to witness that stage of her crossing over. And so to this day, I don't know why, but I trust, I have to trust that um, it was all in his will. And I thank you for sharing that. Uh, and being so transparent. If you had to speak to someone who, is currently where you were in their grief journey and asking God why um, and not understanding how they prayed about it and fasted about it and cried about it and uh, believed God for healing. Um, and the healing didn't happen the way they um, had hoped that it would. And 
they themselves are angry with God. Uh, what would you say to that person in terms of what what advice would you give them uh, on their grief journey uh, so that they won't get stuck in a place of pain and unforgiveness? To be honest with God about how you truly feel. Um, I think that's, that's being transparent with God because he knew anyway how I felt. Um, being able to verbalize it and not faking it to fitting in, not faking it so that people, especially um, church people, um, won't move your process of grieving on for you when you're not yet there. And, you know, a lot of times with church people, um, you praise your way through grief. You know, you glorify God through grief. And that's not everyone's process. So I would encourage someone to really get clear and get still about what the passing of their loved one really means to them, not on a surface level, but on a true soul level, because your soul has been shaken. And if you had, um, if you were a practicing Christian or someone of faith, and that has been shaken or shattered, to really seek God in prayer, even if you don't have the words to speak, say, God, I need you or help me. But keeping some form of um, communication with spirit, with the universe uh, is key. And then getting to a space because you for me, I was closed off for a while. I didn't want to hear from God. It's different stages. And, and when you hit that stage of pure brokenness, when your heart is so heavy with pain, so full of grief that you don't think that you could inhale not one more time without your whole inside shattering, um, that's when God will step right in and actually gather up and hold all the pieces of your broken heart as they crumble right before his throne of grace. And his mercy and love and kindness um, brought me brought me through it. You have really taken us down your grief journey and your pathway. In a couple of sentences, could you tell us who Sandra Faye Clark was? Hmm. Sandra Faye Clark, as we called her, Faye, was, she had a huge heart. Uh, a huge heart. She was a giving person um, to, to the end. She was always willing to serve. Um, wonderful singer. She sung on the choir. Faye was always involved. She was active. She was a go-getter. And um, she got saved at the age of six years old. She was the youngest uh, person that my grandmother uh, ever got saved in her church. She accepted Christ and was baptized in Jesus' name and tarried for the Holy Ghost at the age of six and never left the church. Uh, she, when she left, she left to go to glory. And so she had a powerful testimony of what God had saw and brought her through uh, all of her her years. So she was an extraordinary person. I miss her to this day. Um, outside of my grandmother, Faye, 
means the world to me of those who have gone on. If I could, this sounds like she had a powerful testimony. Would you mind reading it for us? Miss um, Sandra Faye Arnold Clark. Her testimony, um, it was Monday, December the 4th, 1995. At 10.05 a.m., uh, her testimony was recorded by my sister, um, Rochelle Campbell, um, because she was there. And so she began writing everything that transpired with Faye. So at 10.05 a.m. on Monday, December 4th, 1995, Faye says, I feel a strange feeling. Lee, Rochelle, and Deborah started repeating the 23rd Psalms. I see and hear you all, but I am not in this hospital. I am half here and half somewhere else. Don't cry, Lee. Lee was her sister. Don't cry, Lee, Shell, and Deborah, which were her cousins. I am in a dark place. Oh, I'm going through. Oh, I see Jesus. Shell, I'm flying. I'm flying up. Oh, Jesus, please let me see Jonathan. Jonathan was her son. About 12.05 to 12.30, Faye saw Jonathan. He arrived from Chabane. That's where he was stationed. And he was trying to get home to see her. 3.25 p.m., I feel that feeling again. Oh, Jesus, I'm tired of suffering. I'm tired of not being able to breathe. Oh, Jesus, please. I'm so tired. Okay, Jesus. Pastor Campbell and Aunt Lutie, Aunt Lutie is my mother, told me you would be with me. She asked earlier if we could hear Jesus talking to her. We replied, no. It must be a conversation between you and him. 9.15 p.m. Shell, I'm having that feeling again. Hold me, Shell. I held her. That's what my sister said. 9.30 p.m. Faye repeated about 30 times. Don't worry, don't worry. Shell, don't worry. Uncle Joe, don't worry. Mama, don't worry. Shell, call Pastor Campbell and tell her don't worry. Tell Aunt Lutie, Uncle Bro, and Lee not to worry. Deborah, don't worry. Tell the children, don't worry. Oh, Jesus, I'm ready. 9.40 p.m. Yes, Jesus, Give me water, Shell. I gave her some water. Thank you, Jesus. I'm saved, she smiled. Jesus is here. I see Jesus. Her body quickened with the Holy Ghost as Mother Arnold, which was her mom, Elder Joseph Corn, which was her uncle, Sister Rosa Sutherland, a sister in the church, and Rochelle, my sister, repeated the 23rd Psalms. Faye gripped hold to Shell's hand, and Faye's body quickened again. She did not let go of Shell's hand until she took her last breath at 9.50 p.m. Faye's last testimony, written by Rochelle Campbell. Um. She left in a big way. He came and got her. And that's something that um, we had told her, that she would not have to be alone. That Jesus, whom she loved, known, and served since the age of six, that when it was time for her to go, 
home, he would be the one to come and get her. And her testimony proved that he did come. Oh, it's amazing that uh, even though that you weren't there, yes, he was there. He was there. And truly, um, it took a while to understand that. But un honestly and wholeheartedly, him being there is all that mattered. And I believe that our spirit is here and watching over you. If Faye was physically present here today, hmm. what do you think she'd say to you? Do it, girl. Do it. And do it big. That's what she would say. Because in everything she did, they always went all out. Because uh, what else she got to lose? So she would, um, with all that I do in community, she, if she's present, she'd say do it. And do it big. Give it all you got. And in return, what would you say to her? You taught me well. You taught me well. Indeed she did. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you. Grief for me was a bag of confusion. It's a bag of confusion for me because it comes with so much. It comes with not understanding. It comes with... Um, It's just a bag of confusion for me. If I if I had if I had to say one word, it's a it's a mix of emotions, you know. And um, and for me, grief is hard because I don't know how to intertwine it. Because actually, while I'm trying to grieve, it always seems like so many other things are going on. You know, I'm the type of person when I grieve, I want to grieve alone. You know, I don't want 500 people asking me, is it something I can do for you? You know what I'm saying? I don't need that because that, that take away my focus. I need to be to myself. I need to be in peace and quiet because that's how I associate with God. I can't do it with folks knocking on the door, bringing food, flowers and all that. It's not how I work. I have to work sitting, talking with God in silence. Then I can allow other people in. You know, I have to, my mind just works different. I have to deal with it myself first, and then I can embrace others in. Uh, as you know, we're talking about grief journeys. Uh, and a lot of times people think that there are certain ways that people grieve. Uh, and so, um, and I am really just exploring different uh, individuals' grief practices. I know that sometimes we uh, grieve one way for a parent, grieve another way for a spouse, and, and then we grieve another way for a friend. Um, so first of all, I just want you to kind of first tell me a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, my name is Marcus Davis. I'm the deacon at Amani, and with that comes responsibilities. One of them is being a caregiver when needed. I sort of felt like being a caregiver came naturally because I was doing it without even knowing it. Uh, it just fell in my lap. I've been doing it for years, not knowing it. And then once I became aware that what I was doing was being a caregiver, um, It was such a fulfilling joy. I didn't realize the impact that I was making at that time on people's lives, as well as them on mine. Because in doing it, it helped to teach me patience. Um, it helped to teach me to be humble. Because a lot of times I had to unselfishly put their needs before my own, with no pay, no fanfare, and things like that. But when I say the reward to the end, was better than fanfare or money. I just can't explain it. And I know that during this time of um, 
bonding and caregiving uh, relationships develop. And mm -hmm. sometimes the person becomes more than just a, a patient or mm -hmm. someone that you're providing care for. Yeah. Uh, could you talk about how friendship has evolved as you do what you feel like you're called to do? Yeah. Actually, being a caregiver, that person has to really trust you. That person is trusting you to make health decisions that's going to affect the rest of their life, no, how, no matter how long it may be. Being a caregiver, a person may start weaning you into their financial part of their life where you help oversee that. That's, that's trust. So it really becomes a bond between two people or several individuals, a person have more than one caregiver, but it becomes a real strong bond because they're pretty much putting their life and a lot of their major decisions in your hands. So they trust you. You know, and as that trust, you know, evolves and what we're talking about uh, is grief. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you probably, you know, you've been a caregiver and you've seen people recover and and go on to thrive, but you've had to go down that road of grief and you've lost individuals that you have invested, as you said, time and, and, and trust and vulnerability has been shared and then yet you've had to see that person transition. Could you tell me a little about some, your grief journey and how you deal with that uh, when you have to lose someone that you've been caring for? Right. Well, like you said early on in our interview, uh, my grief process was different between family members, friends, co-workers. It depends on the relationship. It depends on doing the process of giving for them how much control they give you. You know, I've had some people that just wanted me to take them to the doctor. Well, I had other people who wanted me to make their medical decisions. You know, I've had people to, when a doctor asked them what they want to um, be revived, they would ask me, should they or shouldn't they? And that, that's a big step. But um, for me, one of the things that really helped me, and I hope it helped someone, is I heard when um, a friend of mine transitioned, pastor told me that grief come in waves. Someday there'll be big waves. Someday there'll be little waves. Some days there'll be no waves. Because when I personally thought about grief and how grief would affect me, I thought it was going to be three weeks of just crying, 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 not wanting to do nothing, not wanting to go nothing. But I realized, for me, grief comes in spurts. It comes in seeing somebody who hadn't known the person past and ask me about them. You know, and it may be a happy occasion. And all of a sudden somebody say, how is so-and-so? And then, it, you know, I have to break down to them, they pass. And then 9 out of 10, a person won't know how they pass. Did they suffer? Was it, you know, was it long? And depending on how I have to go into that with them, Depends on how it affects me. Because if it's just somebody in passing, I'll be like, well, you know so-and-so passed, and they'll be like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Then I maybe can keep it moving. But if it's somebody that was maybe closer to that person, they want to ask a little more in depth, and I have to go deeper and deeper explaining to them during that process, it be bringing up things that I may not have allowed myself to experience because of the hurt associated with it, if that makes sense and stuff like that. So it really comes in spurts. It comes in TV shows that we both enjoyed. You know, it's a new season. This person in transition, but the story that took a storyline, this would be the person I would call up to share about it. You know, if I call you, you might be like, oh, that's corny, I don't watch that. But me and this individual really shared that show, all the fun that came with it and stuff, but they're no longer there to do that. So when the show is on and I want to share it with somebody, they're not there. So sometimes a sadness come over. You know, um, birthdays, Christmas, things of that nature. But the person I'm speaking in individually is my good friend, Brenda. She used to come with me to church and stuff. That's one of the reasons why I chose to do the interview here. I was going to do it at hospice where she passed because during her roughest times, I would take her out to smell the roses. 
they had a rose garden. And I used to always tell her, make sure you take time to smell the roses. So especially near the very end, she would say, hate, hate me to smell the roses and stuff. So I was going to ask you to let's go there today, but it was so cold outside. So I figured I would do the next place we shared, which was here, which is bringing up a lot of feelings for me. Good, bad, and sad, and happy. So I'm like a mixed bowl of emotions right now. So it sounds like you more than a caregiver, you were a friend. You yeah. Shared a deep yeah. Friendship. Yeah. What would you say to someone who has lost a friend? Well, trying to navigate this grief journey. I would tell them to focus on the good times. I would tell them to focus on what they shared together. For me, like I said, how I would take her outside, I don't go back to the specific place she died, but when I go to parks and nature, I associate that with me taking her outside. So I would tell them to find common grounds that they did, that, that they both shared, they brought joy. Because it helps me. Did you find that when she passed, did you ever experience anger with yourself or anger with God? No, actually I relieved. Well, if I can step out the rim for a minute, I found anger with God when I lost my mom. Because it was such a young age. And I wasn't well either. I was like, so I found anger there. But in the situation with my girlfriend, Brian, I actually found joy and happiness and rejoicing because she knew the Lord. So I knew she, I knew where she was going and I knew she knew where she was going. So in her transition, and for me, it was joy because she was in so much pain and, you know, the loss of sight and the ability to walk. So I was ready for her to go walk with God since she couldn't walk here on earth with us no more. And you said that you felt some anger when your mother passed? Yeah. How did you deal with that and how long did it take? Well, well, for one, I can't be mad at God for long, so <laughs> they didn't, there wasn't long. But I just, I was just like, because I wasn't well. I was like, okay, I can understand I'm not well, but to take my mom to at the same time, I couldn't make sense of it. And then you, then um, that was before my faith walk too. So now I know better, I would be thinking better. And embrace others and empathy. And as a caregiver, I know, because um, I know a little bit about your story, um, you had to deal with waves of grief from one person to the next. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of caregivers and a lot of people, uh, even just not, even if they don't caregivers, sometimes families, they experience the death of a sister and a cousin. And sometimes it comes in threes. I've heard mm -hmm. Yeah. And how do you grieve the death of a loved one when it seems like two or three months later somebody else dies a month later somebody else dies and it just looks like it's not going to let up and I think that I've seen you navigate it very well could you mm -hmm. tell us how your practices and things that you use to be able to manage that so effectively well that was true I actually started um I lost my oldest brother in October and my mom in February. So it was hard to grieve him because before she passed, she was sick. So it is, I just don't know. But um, if I had to describe it, I think what I do, me personally, is depending on my level with you, it's almost like I don't allow myself to fully let a person go ahead and be what we would be called dead. And to give you an example for that, if a, a friend or classmate die, okay, far as I go, they die. But we'll say like my mom or my good friend, Brian, it's a part of me that I seem to never really let them die. That way I never really have to face it that they're not coming back. So for me, their passing is like a drip, drip, drip. You know what I'm saying? Um, I slowly let them go. And it takes years. My mom been dead like 20 years. 
and I'm still, I can almost say to the point where I finally maybe released her. You know what I'm saying? Because I guess it would probably be too hard for me. Because they're almost like my DNA. Everything about them, I see it, I see it every day. Or I'm going to hear about them every day. Or it's something that's going to make them a part of my everyday life. You can't keep them real in your life. Uh, yep, it's almost like I, I, certain people that are so close, I can't just completely let them go. Like a classmate. Okay, she's passed. She's gone on. She'll never be back or whatever. But like my mom or my uh, best friend, Brian, you know, releasing them is not as easy. So that's a long, long, drawn-out process. It's the only way I could deal with it. Do you think, does it comfort you to feel like um, that you're keeping the memory alive? Do you ever feel the presence? Yes. 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 Actually, um, God, I knew you was going to make me say this. Some nights in Bible study, Brian used to sit beside me. Some nights I want to tell people, somebody's sitting there, you know, and just let me have that seat empty. You know, it's almost like, let me wait on her or just let her spirit be there. You know, sometimes I just want to be in Bible study. That seat is taken. You know? Awesome. In grief, I know that a lot of times people grieve the most because they are seeing things that they never got to tell their loved mm -hmm. ones. Do you ever feel regret? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, many of them. Many of them. Um, in preparing myself to come today, um, when my friend Brian was very, like days away from near the end, she had told me, she said, you make sure that um, in my nice little drawers, all my journals, and one promise she made me make to her was that to get them. So I don't know if this was something she didn't want her family to read. I don't know if it's something that she and I hadn't spoken for in years. Maybe she read about it that she wanted me to read to explain, her, you know, her reasoning for things that she may have done. Um, but I didn't get them. So, that's not nothing I regret telling her, but it's something that I wish I could have done for her. But then, um, as I prayed on it, I was saying, I know God do things for a reason. So, maybe it was something in those journals wasn't meant for me to see or read or whatever, so... And I noticed that you mentioned God and church and your prayer life. How has your faith been instrumental on in you navigating your grief journey? Oh, man. Well, let's just say if it wasn't for my prayer journey, my prayer walk, my faith walk, I know I wouldn't have probably been as patient as I was, as considerate. Um, everything I was, I probably wouldn't have been if it wasn't for my faith walk. Oh. And speaking of the fact that you've had to see so much heartache and loss, do you feel that you learn different things from different transitions, from different grief journeys? Yes. Do different people teach you different things? Yes. Yes. But um, the biggest thing I think I've learned is the small things people people hold on to, um, the things we worry about, the things we take for granted in this life. Um, one of them was people transitioning and worrying about what people thinking. Uh, I'm not speaking on one person in this part. People transitioning and 
I've had a person that was going to be leaving the surf in like three days. They was worrying about paying their phone bill. They weren't well enough to answer it, so they won't answer it. They couldn't text, you know, they had, couldn't do nothing with it. Message box was full. You couldn't leave a message. It wasn't physically able to pick it up, text, type, or whatever. But they were so worried about paying their phone bill. At hospice, laying up in the bed. But their phone bill needed to be paid. You know, um, if there was one thing that I could share with somebody that's grieving, I would tell them that. Life is short, including yours. Take time to smell the roses and don't stress over the little things. My final question is, if Brian would to walk in the door at the moment and you could just tell him one thing, what would you tell her? I would tell her I miss her. I would tell her I love her, and I would thank her because out of one person, I mean, she's one of the one person that I know who she was proud of where God was taking me. She was supportive of where God was taking me. She would, she would do whatever it took to keep me on my faith walk. If I got discouraged, she would read, she would just recite a scripture and go in depth to it, to my heart changed, my thinking changed. You know, when she knew it was things that I couldn't understand, she would go find literature, buy it, for me to read it, to get it. So that way I didn't have to hear it from her. I can read it for myself over and over and over and over and over. And it brings me to a, to a um, thing. This is one of my journals. She bought me several of them. She wanted me to start journaling my faith walk. And if I could, I'm going to read you the first paragraph out of it if you may. She wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always and again. I say rejoice, Philippians 4.4. 4. Love you, Brenda, Christmas 2011. Right? And this is what I wrote. And mind you, I didn't read this until yesterday, preparing for today. I hadn't read it since I wrote it. This is my first journal ever. It's a gift from one of my good girlfriends, Brenda Burnett. She has been an important part of my adult life. We have been through a lot together. I thank God for her. This is the beginning of a new year. Last year was an amazing year for me. So many changes, so many beginnings for me in 2011, especially the end of the year. I found the church. I first went the third weekend of August 2011. I got baptized in October. I started paying tithes. God has been so good to me in many ways. Amazing. And I stopped there. My first journal. Wow. It sounds like Brenda left you with a lot of special gifts. She did. A lot of special things. She did. She did. Here's a picture of us, and this picture got to be at least 30 years old. Wow. Yeah. No gray hair on the picture. <laughs> so you know it's old. Yes. One final word of wisdom. What would you tell them to do when they feel like they can't make it another day because the person that they love so dearly is not home? I tell them to take it to God in prayer. Take it to God in prayer. That's wonderful advice. Once again, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's like there's an empty space where a person or an animal or you know um, something was but it is there no more how do you deal with grief 
Well, just like, like what I'm doing right now, crying. <laughs> and I don't really mind crying. I know that it's a cleansing. Um, and I just, I'm okay with the tears coming because I know that that means that I've gotten down to another layer, another layer of, um, of um, healing and um, taking care of myself and an understanding of, you know, when my, I had a, a brother who was 12 years younger than me and he um, committed suicide when he was 20 years old. And I wasn't real close with him, but when I talked with my family after his death, I, I had to just, my grief over his, you know, over his death and the way he died, my grief over that forced me into a place of hope where I had to convince myself that I knew that he had gone home to be with the Lord and I had to convince my family of that and I don't think all of them believed the same way that I did. I think some of them believed that if you commit suicide you go to hell, you don't go to heaven. But I don't believe that and um, that was a, um, I was very young when he died and then other people, my grandmother died um, later on, and I missed her presence in my life. Um, but I was, you know, I was going to college and I wasn't at home a lot, and so I didn't really get to see her much um, before she passed away. But I have really great memories of being at her house. Um, my dad passed away when I was probably uh, 40, 42, somewhere around in there. And um, actually the night that he died, I, he came to my room and appeared to me and um, I was just so sad and I missed him so much because he lived in Virginia and I was in North Carolina and I didn't get to go see him before he passed away. But it was his way of coming to say, I'm fine. He was smiling at me and um, he just sort of stood there like he always does with his hands in his pockets and just smiling at me like I'm I'm okay I'm gonna be all right and you will too I um I think about um, my partner Robin when she passed we were like one person and it took me actually it took me much longer to get over her passing than anyone else that I've ever known in my whole life it's one of those things that I don't always share it with people because I know I'm going to cry and that makes them uncomfortable and they don't know how to deal with my tears but um, I usually get alone by myself and just let it come out I just let it all pour out and I, um, I thank God for the time that we had for um, for the the memories that I have and little things that they would say or do that remind me of them you know and the, I see in other people I see likenesses of my brother my dad my grandmother and my partner Robin I see likenesses and it's God's way I think of saying you know they're not here but you are and you still have you still have a destiny to fulfill so um, prayer helps a lot um, just being thankful music helps me forever too it's always been my way of dealing with emotions that are hard emotions that are very strong and raw um, it's it's a way to calm my spirit down and um, Actually, it's good because music comes out of that that I can share with other people. So I know that it's it's good. It's it just feels right for me to to write music and to to play and sing. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray first. Let's pray. Okay. The Lord asks that you be in this time that um, we would just give you glory 
and that you would be in our presence and in our midst and bless this project for Annie help her to grow in the knowledge of how to run the equipment and to put together the final product I ask that you would bless the work of her hands because she wants to please you and may this um, the topic of this documentary touch lives in a way that brings people closer to you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. But um, Music has always been a part of your life. It has. Um, when I was in um, a senior in high school, one of my good friends came and asked me if I wanted to come to a Bible study. And I was, I, I kind of liked this person a lot. And um, so I said, sure, not knowing. I'd never been to a Bible study. I didn't know what a Bible study was. So um, I went, and she said, well, by the way, there's this guitar player from Britain who's going to come, and um, you bring your guitar. You can play with him, and, you know, you guys can jam, and we can just have a good time. So I took my guitar, and the guy didn't show up, but Jesus showed up. <laughs> And um, it was the most incredible night of my life, sitting around um, with other high school kids. Just, you know, I didn't know what happened to me because um, I'd never felt such peace and such lightness before. And I just asked Jesus to be in my life and to be um, Lord over my life. It sounds like it was almost... A meeting with destiny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In a very musical place. Yeah. Nature. Yeah. Tell me about Robin. Did was she music to your ears and a <laughs> melody in your heart? She was. Um, I happened to be in a band with a couple of other friends of mine and we were playing um one of the diners here in town. It was a Night Street Bakery. I think they had a Friday and Saturday night they had groups come in and you could play and they gave you part of the door and they gave you paid you in a loaf of bread or whatever it was kind of kind of fun but um that's where I met Robin I was I was singing with a friend of mine and um, Robin had gone to hear the the group that was playing and she came up to me during one of the breaks and she said what's your name I what are you doing here you are so good you know and I was like blown away because I, I couldn't get past looking in her eyes just the depth of her eyes were like it was it just it took me by storm and um I will never forget just you know her eyes just said would you be my friend I need a friend, and I want you to be my friend. And so I, I took her on as, you know, we were friends for a long time. I knew I was in love with her that moment, but it took her a little longer to realize that um, we were developing something far more than just a regular friendship. But it was a friendship that, that turned into um, hearts full of love. And, um, yeah. Well, so what... What would you say uh, was Robin's greatest quality? She was um, pretty much uh, spontaneous and she was willing to try anything. Um, not things that were dangerous or anything like that or, or um, mean, but she was just adventurous, you know, and she was very curious about life. And she asked so many questions. And um, she would ask questions about things that I thought I already knew the answer of why I believed certain things. And then she would ask a question and really stretch me as far as trying to be able to give her an answer. And sometimes I found out that I don't know why I think that. I don't know what. I, I have an answer that I've used my whole life, but I don't know if it's really valid. And she made me think, you know, and um, she, was just, she was just a joy. She was very childlike in some ways, but very um, coach-like in another way, you know. And so, you know, we're talking about uh, grief. Mm -hmm. So, 
take us there and tell us what happened. Okay. And how did you begin your grief journey as it relates to Robin? Okay, I think um, we had been dating for about a year and a half, and we decided to buy a house. We bought a house in Durham, and I was still working over at the um, RTP in the park. And um, she got a phone call one Friday afternoon from her doctor who said that she had cancer. And that's when my grief journey started. Um, I was afraid that I was going to lose her. And that, was, that was exactly where I went when she told me that the doctor told her she had cancer. So I said, well, what are we going to do? And so she said, I want you to go to my visit. I have a visit scheduled for next week, and we're going to have some scans, and they're going to take some, do some blood work and that kind of thing. It sounds like Robin was very um, important, instrumental, uh, a vital part of your happiness and joy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the time that y'all sh- that you shared together. Um, so I know it had to be very difficult uh, to to get the news, uh, to get that phone call. Yeah. And uh, how did you prepare? How did you process through that that telephone call? Well, there's really I wasn't prepared for it at all, and so all I did after hearing that news was just to, I just reacted. Um, and I was trying to to gauge what um, Robin was planning to do um, and see how I could help her. My focus really was not on myself anymore at that point. I was I was more concerned with helping her find um, find her way through the news of having cancer and whatever she needed from me, you know, going to the doctors and that kind of thing. I had no idea how grueling that was going to be. Um, she was at stage four when they discovered she had cancer. So she was pretty far along. Um, how long had y'all been together? Well, we'd only been together probably less than two years at that point. But, you know, she... Um, she lived another probably 10 years after that. I mean, we kept looking at things on the internet that said, you know, the mortality rate was very low and all this and um, or was very high. Um, and it was very scary. It just it scared me to pieces. And um, I was like, I just found her. I can't be losing her now. You know, and so her cancer was um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and she had an autologous stem cell transplant over at the hospital in UNC, and it was like eight weeks of being in an isolation unit, and I was working, and it was it was so hard. I was going to work, coming back home, feed the dog, go over to UNC, take her clean clothes talk with her for a couple of hours, sit with her for that long, and then get her dirty clothes, bring them home, do laundry, go to work the next... It was just a circle. It was a circus of of activity, and I don't know how we made it through. So what was her disposition during this time? She was just, like, so upbeat. She was, like... We, we had things in her room that were colorful, um, stuffed animals that she liked. You know, we had... It was, like, the nurses said... We can see now this is going to be the party room. <laughs> and she was just, you know, she was just vivacious and she didn't, she never met a stranger. So she would talk with you and, and get into, you know, knowing you and that kind of thing. And um, she was just a really special, special person. Uh, the last couple of days uh, leading up to her transition. Mm hmm. How was that for you? Well, um, did you know it was happening? Yes, we did. We we knew that um, it was, everything with her disease progression 
it seemed like Christmas time was the time that it got worse. For years, every Christmas, we just kind of knew, well, I'm going back in the hospital because now I've got this. I've got something else. And, and we almost lost her several times before um, we actually had to put her into hospice. Um, hospice came to our house, and they set us up. And she, Robin said, I, we need a team. We need a team to work on this. I can't, you can't do this by yourself, and I can't either. And I resisted for a while because I wanted to think that I could do everything that she needed to have done for her, but I couldn't. And so we had 12 people, <laughs> and they would come at different times. And they were there um, the very last day that she was um, with us, right be the afternoon that she transitioned. Um, I heard footsteps in the hallway, and... I was like, there's nobody here but me and my daughter and everybody else. I sent them home because it was Sunday and everybody was trying to get ready for work the next day. And and then I went to check on her and she was still in the same condition. And so I sat down in, in the living room and a few minutes later I heard footsteps in the hallway again. Like somebody walking with stocking feet. And... I went to check on her again, and by that time, she had passed. Mm -hmm. But she waited till everybody had left, and then she was by herself and um, to to pass because I don't think she wanted me to watch. Well, as soon as I got back there with her and realized I think she's gone, I got a knock at the back door, and it was one of our other friends who wasn't really scheduled to come by that day, but she just felt like dropping in, and she happened to be an EMT and um Kathy and so I said Kathy come here you got to help me and so Kathy came in the bedroom and I said is she still here or is she gone and Kathy said she did a couple of things checking for a pulse and she said she's gone and it was like I, I kind of had a relief because I knew that she had been in pain so much and now she didn't have to be in pain anymore and so I was glad for that, but at the same time, it was this sadness, this emptiness that it really happened. You know, it was, we're really there now. You know, uh, Elizabeth Kubler Ross says that in order to conquer grief, we have to face it. It sounds like you crossed over to the threshold of grieving on that day and looked grief in the face. What did that feel like? Facing grief. Well, I didn't know that that's what I was doing. And I didn't know... I just didn't know the depth of grief that I would experience. Um, days and weeks later um, I didn't go back to work for about a month maybe six weeks I wasn't ready to face the world and I didn't want to face the world without her and so um, I would be in the car driving somewhere and I would just break down and cry and bawl and just uncontrollably and I'd have to pull off to the side of the road until I got finished and I would I would pray and it was like God you've got to help me <sighs> and um, I would I just I'm okay I um I did that a lot in the first in the first couple of weeks, and um, we had talked, you know, about me staying in the house after she was gone. And she said, "Are you going to be able to stay in this house after I'm not here?" And I said, "Yes, I will be able to stay here. Um, I will miss you terribly, but I will stay here because this is the house that you know we made this our home." And um, so I faced, I faced the depth of grief that I had never experienced before. 
um, after she passed. It was like weeks and weeks and even years. Sometimes the grief would just hit me out of the blue and I would just have to deal with it. You know, I just have to stop what I was doing and sit with it and just be with it and let it have its work on me. Mm. Because all of that was um, me learning how to let her go. I couldn't hold on to her anymore. Um, and that's kind of was, that was our hallmark. We were going to be buddies till we both, you know, we were both going to go together <laughs> kind of thing. But it didn't happen that way. You know, uh, a lot of times people will put a time limit on grieving. Do you think there's a proper amount of time that it takes to lose a spouse or a partner? Or is it, or is it something? I don't know. I don't know, Annie. I um, I know it took me a long time, probably longer than some other people, but I don't know if it's just because people don't let you see that. They don't let you into that part of their heart. Um, but I always, I always wanted to move on, you know, I thought it was healthy for me to move on, not really knowing what that looked like. Um, I think I have a lot better idea now. I mean, I'm still sad. I miss her. She was my best friend. Yeah. Um, so you talk about, um, moving on. What were some of your grief practices? Was music instrumental? Mm -hmm. And you coping during your grief journey as it relates to Robin? Yeah. I, um, one of the things that we did, um, and I would do this, um, just sometimes I would, I would buy balloons and I would write on, I'd get them filled with helium and I'd write on them and write different messages to her and just release them as a kind of a symbolic way of releasing her and letting her go. And um, I did that three or four times, three or four different times, just to, you know, just to let go. It's like, face it, you know, that, um, and, and not to be hard on myself about it, but just to recognize that I was holding on. And she's not coming back. But she's not totally gone either. I still believe she's around. You know, how did your faith help you in your grieving process? I wouldn't be here without my faith. Um, I wouldn't have been able to make it through. I um, I would thank God every day for the life that we had together and the fun that we had and the deep, deep love that we had for one another. And I missed the little things like she would take her hand and move my hair onto the wrong side of my head. It felt so icky to me. And I was just like, I, would, I missed that. Of all the little things that she used to do, I missed that. And um, she told me one day that um, I could rearrange the house any way I wanted to after she was gone. And she said, I know, you can do that. Because we used to argue. We had difference of opinion about how to decorate. And um, I said, well, I will if you promise not to come and rearrange it after I've done it. And she just laughed, and she said, I would never do that. I said, but you do it all the time now. <laughs> but um, just I, one of the things that really gives me um, a sense that um, I did the right things, um, um, I lived a life that Robin could see Jesus Christ in me. When we would go to church and she would say, well, I, I, I love God, but when y'all talk about Jesus Christ, I just substitute God for that. And I said, that's good. That's good. 
because she didn't she didn't know Jesus as her Messiah, but she came to know Jesus as her Messiah, and I am so pleased that God allowed me to have a part in that that part of her life, you know, to um to be able to witness with my life, not with my words so much, because she could talk me under the rug, but. I I just lived my life in front of her and she asked me questions about who this Jesus guy was, you know, and I told her who he was to me and I said, I'm not trying to change your mind. I'm not trying to get you to convert or anything like that. And she said, well, can I, if I accept Jesus, can I still be Jewish? And I said, I should hope so. He was Jewish. <laughs> so it was just this on an Easter Sunday she got baptized and it was the most wonderful thing and that was the day that I met um, my family here Liz and Gloria oh. that Sunday and um, that was when that started wow. that friendship a lot of people are grappling with trying to cope with the pain of the loss of a loved one. Uh, what would you tell someone who has lost a partner, a husband, a wife, bone of their bone, flesh of their flesh, mm -hmm. someone that they've known very intimately and their hearts have been intertwined? Yeah. What advice would you give them as they travel their own grief journeys? I would start out with um, don't be afraid to feel what you feel when you miss them and to remember all the good things all the good memories and even write about them if you you know if you're a person that likes to write um, I did a lot of journaling and I have um, notes and books of journals of things that I th what my thoughts were and you know because I didn't have her to talk to anymore I had to talk some way um, and, but I think um, also I would have some little rituals that we used to do we used to do things together we did certain things at certain times of the year um, like at Valentine's Day, I would still celebrate Valentine's Day and I would dedicate, you know, a song to her and I would sing it to her and um, I would have her favorite food, you know, on her birthday or just, I would still celebrate some of those things that, you know, gave me joy and gave us joy when she was still here. Um, there are, there are groups, uh, support groups where you can, go and talk with other people who are experiencing grief as well. Um, I went to a counselor and talked about it with them and just because I wanted to make sure I was not stuck in it. I didn't want to be able to, I didn't want to get bogged down in it, you know, and just to check in, a reality check, am I, am I progressing somewhere in the normal range of how people um, deal with grief because you know I'm looking at myself assessing myself and I could fool myself too you know so um, just talk about things talk about what you feel with other people that you know care about you and um, don't be afraid to um, to talk to them even though they're gone you know you can say you know I really liked it when you told me XYZ or you know I really enjoyed our our cruise to Alaska I really enjoyed our days at the beach they were some of my fun you know most fun days um, so if Robin were to walk in the room at this very moment what would you say to her I would just look at her and she would see me and we wouldn't need any words.
Thank you, Todd. Thank you for letting me tell my story. God bless you. too. So music, how it has been a part of like, in your life uh, in so many ways. Um, and I'm sure it's still a very important part of your grief journey afterwards. Um, so Robin was here and no words were needed. And you wanted to play her a song. Mm -hmm. What song would that be? It's a song that um, I wrote for our union um, ceremony. Um, when we couldn't get married at the time, but we had a union ceremony. Um, and I wrote her this song. <laughs> You are my dream come true. You hold my destiny in your heart. Everything I want to be I see in your eyes when you look at me. You are my dream. Everything I want to be Oh Everything I want to be All that I imagine I see in your eyes when you look at me now that I found you I'll never let you go And that is how I know Love without end Love of my best friend Love that will last a whole life through Loving you You are my dream Come true You hold my destiny in your heart everything I want to be all that I imagine I see in your eyes when you look at me I 
see in your eyes when you look at me. Thank you.